million. The art world. Glamour. Wealth. Intrigue. 95. Selling at 95 million dollars. Beneath the surface, there's a darker place. A world of high stakes and gambles. International art dealer Philip Mould knows the risks. He hunts down sleepers, paintings that hide secrets. In the past, we looked at pictures. Now almost you can look through them. Paint almost acts like blood at a crime scene. I'm Fiona Bruce, with over 20 years experience as a journalist. Every picture tells its own story, and it's up to us to try and uncover it. We're teaming up to investigate human dramas and mysterious tales locked in paint. This story began with a magical discovery at an antiques roadshow. We've got a picture worth up to 30,000 pounds. Bingo! <laughs> A rubbish tip find took Tony and his daughter Selena halfway around the world. Bidding here now, 120,000. I have 130,000. But no one could have predicted how it would end. That's the first time I've seen it in nearly 15 years. Really? In the business. This last minute? Yes. Yes. I'm selling it at $300,000 and sold. Here we are, we're at Cobb, or Cove, I think it's pronounced. Are you good at sort of like shouting out as we go along? Well, I'm very good at shouting. Whether I'm good at map reading and shouting, I don't know. Boring. So you can be like a talking sat nerve. Right. When the ferry docks, turn left. <laughs> That's what I reckon. You've got one of those sort of, uh, you must obey, but also seductive. <laughs> In fact, you'd actually make a rather good sat nerve. Mm. Early last summer, Philip and I found ourselves in an unusual spot for an art investigation. We were brought to this quiet corner on the southwest coast of Ireland by a chance encounter at an antiques roadshow. So you went on a fishing trip, but you came back with more than just fish. You came back with these. Yeah. It's, uh, it's my local spot I fish, because it's only half of my walking distance to where I fish. And so I just gathered them up, took them out. Most interesting. Have you actually reflected on what's written in the bottom right-hand corner? Winslow Homer. And Winslow Homer is about the most important watercolorist at work in America in the 19th century. Yeah. He's one of the great artists who define American art heritage. <laughs> you netted something else that day. You've got a picture worth up to £30,000. <laughs> 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 Bingo! You don't have to cry right up. It's yours. It took a couple of days for it actually to sink in quite what had happened. I mean, the name Winslow Homer is hugely important. I mean, he's not known to all people in this country, but in America he's got almost mythical status. And the combination of a great name like that and a painting that had been found on a rubbish dump it was the stuff of fairy tales. Oh, I can't wait to get to this place. I've got this sort of bleary image of sort of rubbish dumps and treasures and all this sort of business. And also, once we see it, we'll get a clear idea of how on earth it could have got there mm. and who might have put it there. Tony Varney was the lucky fisherman who found that bundle of pictures 20 years ago next to a rubbish tip in Yule, County Cork. He was living there at the time. We are hoping that by coming back here, we can establish how they got to the dump and just who the children in this painting might be. It all started just here. What, just here? Just there. Just this patch of dirt? Just this patch of it's dirt. Is where you found it? Yes. Pulled so up the vehicle here. And there was the pictures, as simple as that. Take us back then, 20 odd years ago, what was here then? Just a, a dirt bank up here, and just where you could pull in a vehicle and hole in the fence, go fishing. 
that's and, when, and there was there was a, a, a tip here then wasn't there, there was a tip here then which is now as you yeah. can see it's been turned into a recycling center the thing that intrigues me is is who owns this picture because if you pick mm. something up on a tip I mean, outside, there's the issue outside the tip outside, outside the tip, the tip. The and that's tip, important yeah. differentiation yeah and it could is be it, different you know there, you know the legality of whoever brought it here yeah. should they have owned it had they half inched it then is it finders keepers you know if you find it does it automatically belong to you i'm not i, I don't, don't know. know actually we need to find I that don't out. Know. looking around me here you know looking back to yule and looking out to those mountains out there i feel there must be someone out there within the vicinity who had a connection with these pictures to a local person it stands to reason doesn't it otherwise why don't be you yeah. see i think it's absolutely fascinating and i feel that if we can crack that we can crack a lot of what these pictures are all about can i get the impression with tony because he's so laid back isn't he that if he hadn't gone by car that day <laughs> quite you know if, if those paintings yeah. had been there and he'd been on foot he would have just left them there i know which is I mean, he's obviously a, a, a passionate hoarder type collector, isn't he? I mean, he's one of those things that'll pick up anything. And he's picked up a Winslow Homer in the process. As long as it is a Winslow bed. Homer. Well, it, that's a good point. <laughs> if it's not a Winslow Homer, of course, everything goes flat. Yeah. But yeah. I'm convinced it is. I hope that Philip's right, because when I met Tony and his daughter, Selena, at the road show, I got the feeling there's a lot riding on this for them. We're having a time to think, and <laughs> all I can say is that uh, we can't believe our luck. We don't like the picture. It will be restored and sold, and the daughter and the grandchildren will benefit from it. Very nice too. So well, we'd like Tony to had given the painting to his daughter, Selena, before the roadshow. If my valuation is right, she could now benefit to the tune of £30,000 when this picture sells. With Tony and Selina keen to sell the picture, we need to get to work because there are many unanswered questions. We're regrouping at our base in the heart of London's art world, where Philip's head of research, Dr. Bendor Grosvenor, has been preparing the ground. The thing is, I don't want to sound like a total pleb here, but I'm just not that impressed by this Winslow Homer painting. I mean, you know, it just doesn't look that great to me, to be honest. You really have to get your head around how big a name Winslow Homer is. I mean, in the 19th century in America, frankly, this man has got no equals. Have a look at some of these. And this was once the most expensive American painting ever sold. It now belongs to Bill Gates, and he bought it for a reported $30 million. $30 million? It's entitled Lost on the Grand Banks. There's almost a sort of cinematic feeling that the artist is there hanging over the event with a camera. This is entitled Lifeline, and it's exactly that, someone being saved out to sea. I mean, I agree, those are dramatic, they're gripping, I mean, they're wonderful. But the little watercolour that Selena and Tony got, it doesn't look anything like these. Well, I think that's the key thing about Selena's picture, actually, is the fact that it's watercolour because Winslow Homer is the preeminent American watercolorist. And the auction record for one of his watercolors is nearly $5 million. $5 million. And so what we're doing is showing you the type of stuff that, by association, will make those three children highly desirable. The power of that association is about to be tested. Selena and Tony have taken the picture to Sotheby's in London, who bounced it to their art team in New York, where the leading American experts in Winslow Homer are keen to verify it before putting it up for sale. The picture has jet-setted a long way from the dusty loft in Selena's home in the West Midlands. Well, this is basically where the paintings spent half of its life in my loft um, and as you can see it's um, full of bits and bobs and lots of it being my father's as you see here some more of his bits he's brought over old things that he's had over the years magazines he just hasn't thrown keep some so and these are like 1960 some are even older than that so and there's some cards um, 
it's just full of bits. This is a painting off I give me. I haven't thrown it. Just put it um, in the loft as I treated the other one. What lay in Selena's loft all those years was the work of one of America's most influential artists. But my research shows that Winslow Homer was deeply influenced by a period surprisingly spent in Britain in 1881. His love of marine pictures drew him to colour coats on the northeast coast, just a few miles from Newcastle. I want to show Fiona where Homer honed his skills. Was there some kind of artistic community here, or did he just happen upon colour coats? By the time he'd arrived here, there were a few artists here, and it's possible that he had a conversation on the ship over and someone recommended it. There's another reason, though. He loved fishing. Fishing populates his pictures. And it's quite possible he just came here because of his enthusiasm. One critic said, you know, after colour coats, things completely changed, and they did. What, his, his artistic style completely changed? Well, before he came to, to England, and in the early part of his career in the 1860s, he was an illustrator uh, of the Civil War. So he always thought like someone who needs to tell a story. What is it about his paintings and his techniques? It's the sketchiness, it's the freedom, it's the fluency of them. I mean, what, he would just stand out here on the beach, on the breakwater, and just dash the painting off? You can't sit down and, and put up an easel when there's a storm out at sea. I think what he did was he used certainly sketches. He would have done quick sketches, but he also used photography. And there are photographs by Winslow Homer. And I think it was a combination of those things and a great memory. You know, artists, great artists, often have that really powerful visual memory. I mean, the word impressionist is overused, but I think you can use that word about Winslow Homer. He was perhaps the first American impressionist. I mean, one of the techniques he used, which was to great effect, was to profile his figures. And in order to heighten the drama, he loved to silhouette his figures against a, a big sky or a high sea. So the sort of sea acts almost like a sort of wall, but a wall for different characters. And this is, a, is an example of his love of real live drama. Do you recognize where that is? Oh, that's that building. Just about there, isn't it? Yep. Yeah. It's the, um, it was the lifeboat lookout house, wasn't yep. it? If you just look at the quality of the colouring in that, I mean, he's, he's, it's almost as like he's a sort of journalistic photographer on the scene. Yes, it's like it's a snapshot, isn't it, a moment in yeah. time. I mean, they're very different from the picture that turned up that day at the Antiques Roadshow. How was it so obvious to you? I mean, I know it was signed, but it could have been a fake, obviously. I mean, how mm. could you tell that it had the stamp of authenticity that it really was a Winslow Homer? Well, have a look at this one. That again is very close to here. So, two or three things. One, there's a crispness and, and a confidence and the use of the washes. And if you look at the colours there, there's a sort of taste for exoticism, which we see mm. in, in, that, in that watercolour. Certainly this one, I can begin to see, has echoes of the painting we saw at the Antiques Roadshow and the way the faces are done, actually. And that is, The shadow, look there, on the eye, in the eye socket. You're absolutely the way they're done right. There. You're absolutely, there's a similar look to our kids. There were five other pictures found by Tony on the tip. Perhaps they're the clues we need to unpick the mystery of how they got there. My head of research, Bendor, has called us back to base to bring us up to date with some important information about the other pictures. The most interesting one was this watercolour on the bottom left here. It's actually a scene of a beach in the Bahamas. And there's an inscription at the bottom which identifies that it was painted by someone described as Her Excellency, Mrs. Blake. Now, Mrs. Blake was the wife of the governor of the Bahama Islands, so that's presumably why she's painting a beach in the Bahamas. Amongst the other stuff found on the tip was this invitation here to an exhibition in Jamaica. And this, it turns out, is a likeness of the Blakes themselves. I don't that's believe it. Mrs. That's Blake. So, so that's Lady Blake there? That's Lady Blake. How could you be sure? Well, we found other pictures of them and other likenesses, and it all matches And up. that's her. And this here 
is the governor himself. <laughs> him. The governor. The governor. I can't believe it. We've been looking at them so, all the time. So that, so that was with the painting? Yeah. We've and got there a, it is, and a, there they are. a connection here of all this stuff. The really intriguing thing is the fact that the Blakes were in the Bahamas in the mid-1880s. Now, we also know that Winslow Homer was in the Bahamas in the mid-1880s. So it's possible that given that the Homer was found amongst this Blake stuff, that there's some sort of connection here that we need to check out further. So what, they could have been there at the same time? They could have been there at the same time. They could have met? They could possibly have met, or it's possible even that the picture was painted in the Bahamas. And that's why there's this beach scene cool. together. OK, how are we going to take it further? I've taken this as far as I can go here, in the libraries and on the internet. And I think if we're going to prove this connection between Winslow Homer and the Blakes, one of us needs to go and have a rummage around in the archives in the Bahamas. Well, that's straightforward. I'm off to New York this week, and, um, and I'll go by the Bahamas. Hang on a minute. You're going to the Bahamas, and I get to go to Coventry. What's wrong with that? As well as working as a part-time carer, single mum Selina has four kids. So you've got four kids. I can't believe you've got four kids. Yes, You must four have been kids. a child bride. <laughs> so talk me through the kids then. How old are they? Um, Eleanor's 17. Anthony's 15. Ricky's 12. And Rosie's 10. They are lovely kids. They've stuck by me. They are very, very good, loyal, loving children. They are what I get up each day for, they are good. So, how do you feel at the moment? I mean, are you kind of excited? Are you a bit anxious? I'm excited, but I'm also nervous, because um, at the moment the painting's at Sotheby's, and waiting to find out if it is an original, because they could ring or write any time now and say, it's just a copy. So that's it. So <laughs> if it does go for what Philip thinks it might, you know, thirty grand or so, I mean, that's a lot of money. I mean, what difference would it make to you to have that kind Gosh, of money? Gosh, loads. <laughs> Never had anything like that. Thirty pound at like thirty grand. <laughs> no, I just know that the four children will have a secure little nest egg for them between the four of them. Give them a good start. Something, yeah. I'm following in Winslow Homer's footsteps to Nassau in the Bahamas. I want to know why he painted our picture and who the subjects are. From Homer's letters, we know he landed here in December 1884 and that he stayed at the Royal Victoria Hotel. I'm hoping they have a record of his visit. This is looking a bit strange. There's no obvious hotel here. And over there, there looks a slightly grand looking building. And then there's something over there in that corner, but that this is the place where the hotel should be. The Royal Victoria Hotel was the only hotel on the island when Homer came here to paint. It was a glamorous retreat for the social elite. The only thing that remains is the silk cotton tree, a feature of the hotel for almost a century. Bendel's research says it was from this perch a calypso band played for guests like Homer. That's really disappointing, these great gateposts that promised a story and sort of delivered nothing really. But it's not all bad because I know that there is the National Records Office in town, open tomorrow, and with any luck it'll throw up something. Back in London, I'm eager to get some legal advice because what worries me is whether Tony and Selina really own the picture. What exactly does the saying finders keepers mean? And what checks need to be done? Dick Ellis set up the Art and Antique Squad at Scotland Yard in 1989. He now works as an investigator recovering stolen works of art. Sotheby's say they are doing what's called due diligence. Now, what does that involve? It, it really is looking through the whole background, the provenance of an object. 
is the person who's offering it for sale a genuine owner? Uh, everything that the major auction houses sell is checked against the stolen art databases to ensure that these things aren't recorded somewhere as stolen. Um, so due diligence now is a very, very important part of buying and selling works of art. Now, the thing that struck me is that Tony found this, uh, this painting with a few other paintings yeah. just outside a dump. Does that mean it's his? It doesn't belong to the council or, or...? No, it doesn't entirely. As this was in Ireland, you actually have to look at the Irish law, but it's very similar to, to the English law. And what the common law, going way back, um, said was that uh, property which you find, if you take it, that's appropriation. If you do that with no dishonesty, in other words, you, th you think, well, this has been abandoned, it's, it's dumped. In law, you actually have a title to that property as you found it. Is, is that a kind of posh way of saying finders keepers? Yes, that's exactly what they say, finders keepers. The only person who has a superior claim of title to that object is, if you like, the real owner, the person Because this is important, then. Even if I'd thrown something away, knowingly thrown it away, yeah. I could change my mind and then have a claim on getting it back. Yes. So, not entirely straightforward for Tony and Selina. The painting's owners could come forward and claim it. But we still don't know how the picture ended up in Ireland. And with Philip investigating in the Bahamas, Bendor has been digging deeper too. Homer was commissioned by Century magazine in 1884 to go out to the Bahamas to illustrate an article which was designed to get wealthy Americans to go to the islands in the winter. These are some of the illustrations that he used. But what I really want to find out is whether there's proof of any link between Homer's trip to the Bahamas and the Blake's time as governor of the Bahamas. And I think the evidence is quite encouraging so far. First of all, we got Mrs. Blake herself, who was a talented amateur painter. So she probably would have taken some interest in this famous American coming to the islands. And then we've got Governor Blake. Now, he was quite an enlightened colonial governor, and he wanted to get new people to his island, and more importantly, new money to his island. So he probably also would have taken an interest in Winslow Homer's work in trying to get all these rich Americans to the Bahamas. I just really hope that Philip can find some direct evidence that the Blakes met Homer when he was there. The local newspaper could be the place to find evidence that Homer met the Blakes. From Homer's letters, we know he landed in Nassau in December of 1884 and spent most of the winter here. So at least I know which year to pinpoint. It seems that the first newspaper that's published in December, the Nassau Guardian, and even the front page is just full of government notices, all starting His Excellency the Governor, His Excellency the Governor. Blake must have um, looked like a powerful man in this time. What I'm looking for is some sort of social occasion or, or, or some major ceremonial event in which the artist w was involved, because there's probably a fairly small pool of, of, of sort of international famous figures that, that come and go here. You'd have thought that there may be some brushing up with the governor. So this is now January the 3rd. Oh no, things are livening up in town. There's a party for adults and for children given by the governor. Well, not exactly listed prominently, but in a bunch of sort of other attendees. Look what I've just found. Mr. Homer. So Mr. Homer is at the big ball. It also lists what everyone wore. It seems that the theme of the ball was Arabian, so you can imagine all the sort of colour, you know, excuse for really going over the top. How extraordinary. They've identified what the children are wearing. Miss Blake, Princess Perrit's Whistle. Cripes. Master A. Blake, Prince Barman. M. Blake, Prince Purvitz. Winslow Homer could have been doing a portrait of the children dressed up for the ball. This now explains it. 
Winslow Homer was portraying the children of the governor and Lady Blake. Isn't it astonishing how, how you know, you have a hunch and you, 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 you roll up your sleeves and you, you go deep into the times and the sort of preoccupations of the times and in the trivia, the sort of celebrity trivia, just like the sort of stuff we get in Hello Magazine type stuff today, there lies a reference which gives us the key into determining what this picture is about. So Homer and the Blakes met each other. To find such provenance for a picture like this is a great step forward. My next stop is New York. Sotheby's has met the deadline to complete their due diligence checks on the picture. It's been given the go-ahead to make the sale in a week's time. But the picture must still be authenticated for sale by American Winslow Homer experts. They've just returned their verdict, and I'm anxious to hear it. Liz Beeman from Sotheby's has their report and our freshly restored watercolour. Liz, this looks amazing. The colours are so much fresher. The whole thing looks crisper, almost as if it's got like a complete new set of clothing. Now, put me out of my misery. I committed myself on national television. I valued this at £30,000. I now need to find out what your authority has said. Is it or is it not a work by Winslow Homer? Well, it was a lengthy process. We sent it to Abigail Booth Gertz, who's the director of a project on Homer, trying to compile all known works that the artist has ever done. And after careful inspection, she is able to confirm its authenticity as a Homer. Praise the Lord. <laughs> Okay, so now, what impact is that going to have on value? Now, I put 30 grand on it, as you know. Can we improve on that? We think it's actually worth significantly more. We've placed a value of 150 to 250,000. Wow. I mean, that's what, 100,000 pounds plus for us? Yes. Do you really think it'll make that? I have to think that at that enticing estimate and with this exciting story of the discovery, uh, it should do quite well. That amazing news has reached back home. In Coventry, Selina has received an important delivery. Here I have my catalogue that Sotheby's in New York have sent over to me with, hopefully, a print of the picture in it. I am so excited. <laughs> this is it. I know it's all happening now. Sotheby's contacted me to say that they'd had great news, that it was an original, and then they actually told me that the value was wrong. And so instantly I thought, oh, you know, nowhere near as much, but, you know, I'm grateful of everything and anything. Um, and she said, no, the actual value is 150 to 250. And I said, pounds? She says, no, thousands. And I didn't take it very well. <laughs> she rings me up at work and she told me what they had valued it at, at sort of anywhere from 150,000. But you do realise that's a quarter of a million. And with that, off she went to be sick again. Oh my God, there it is. <laughs> Winslow Homer, 1836 to 1910. Children under a palm. <laughs> $150,000 to $250,000. So, as you can see, I'm very, <laughs> very chuffed. So pleased for her and um, just happy. I, I, I'm stuck for words actually, so. <laughs> <laughs> oh, oh, are they all this? Oh. Oh, I see. $150,000 to $250,000. All that for that. I know. Can't, I can't believe it until it's sold, <laughs> you know. That, that's, that's all I can say then. Then I shall, you'll see me excited <laughs> and probably bloody legless. <laughs> so, good health to Wilmot Homer. <laughs>
Winslow, oh. Dad. <laughs> I, what, what's his name? I don't Winslow. even know his name yet. <laughs> Win, Winslow. No. <laughs> I, me teeth are up when I do it. Four days before the sale, and Selena is ready to fly to New York. Selena, what have you just got slide it down. in these bags? I don't know, I'm sure someone's put How bricks in How long are you going for? Them. Two months. So this is it. Yeah. The big off. How are you feeling? I'm very, very nervous. Very nervous. Yeah, very tearful. Why are you, why are <laughs> yeah. you tearful? I am just, I don't want to leave the kids. Mark, can I have a hug? <laughs> yeah, we're ready. Come on then. Well, we are. I don't know about you, Dad. How many cases you've got? Selena's dad, Tony, and her partner, Bob, are travelling to the sale with her. It's their first visit to America. Bye. 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 Good luck. It just means so much to Selena and to her family. I just desperately hope that it all works out for her as she wants it to, and that the painting sells, that it makes money for her and for her gorgeous, gorgeous kids. Oh, wow, look at that big cluster of buildings. What is that? believe that we are over here from a painting. It was just a piece of junk, a piece of trash as they call it here. <laughs> just a bit of rubbish, you know, somebody had discarded and gosh, and the journey it's now brought us on. Exciting one, thrilling one. Coming to America gives Selena the chance to learn more about Winslow Homer. Two days before the sale, she's travelled to see one of the best collections of the artist on the East Coast and to meet Mark Simpson, the collection's curator. I love the ones of the sea because yeah, they're the ones... He's done a lot of them, hasn't he? He has. I've noticed a lot of sea paintings. The picture that you have, I mean, it's 1885, yeah. is that right? It is in 84, 85, and 86 that he makes the biggest statements about the human figure. So it's great that your watercolor concentrates on those three little kids and gives them so much space in the picture. The only other times when that really happens in his oil paintings is in the 80s, in a painting like this with, called Undertow, which is one of those great dramatic scenes. Now, to see this, though, we need to walk back. We need to see it from afar, because Homer anticipated that his pictures would be seen from a distance. Gosh, that's a big painting. <laughs> <laughs> it is bigger than, it is big, it is. And it's, it is in fact the, uh, one of the biggest that he did. That's his kind of that's grand the scale. That's of his, that is that is, that is his, yes. Here, what, are you, what are you thinking about when you see it for the first time? <laughs> I'm just actually amazed. Just the detail, everything. Don't you get the feeling of the sea and the water and the cold? What's the story? What do you think's going on? It's just, I don't know really, it's a bit of a mix there really. You know, you've got one going off that way, one helping the other and I, I just, I don't know, I just don't understand art if you, if you <laughs> understand me. <laughs> but I'll, but I'll, but I'll bet so you do because what you said just then is absolutely right. It is about helping one another. Something else is going on. Something maybe about the idea of how it is that we can all empathize with the struggles that, uh, that take place in the world. We're all a yeah. part of it. We all work against forces that weigh us down or push against us in ways we don't want to go. You could put certain ones, you could put yourself in that picture. Yeah. 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 You know, like you said about her struggling. A lot of emotional struggles I've had, so I suppose that would probably be one, you know, 
well, I say I could put myself in. And you start to express the feelings, don't you? Feel what they're feeling and actually look into it, wonder what's going on, rather than just looking at it and walking past. It's a very powerful painting, isn't it? Back in London, I'm trying to dig up more information about how the picture could have ended up by a tip in a remote corner of Ireland. I'm doing some digging into the lives of Sir Henry and Lady Blake, and I'm beginning to get a picture of how these two paintings came to Ireland. Now, the Blakes had a pretty amazing life, actually. They travelled the world. I mean, after Sir Henry finished as governor of the Bahamas, he and Lady Blake, they went on to similar postings in Jamaica, then they went to Hong Kong, until he retired. And then in the early days of the 20th century, they returned to the place of their birth, to Ireland, and to a house called Myrtle Grove, which is a pretty important house in Irish history, because Sir Walter Raleigh lived there, as it turns out. Now, the thing is, Myrtle Grove, in Yon is just three miles from the dump where Tony found the pictures. So the question is, how did they get there? In New York, 24 hours before the sale, a major problem emerges. Philip, on business in another part of America, gets a call from Selena, desperate for advice. Hi, Selena, how are you? Hi, Philip. Um, I've been better. <laughs> a lot better. <laughs> oh dear, what's the problem? Um, I had a, was out in New York today and had a phone call from Sotheby's um, asking me to, co to come in any time and just have a discussion in regards to a phone conversation that I've had with the Blakes. So I said, no, I'll come straight in. Sorry, say that again. Had a, the, They've had a conversation with, with the, the Blakes. Blakes? yeah. Some descendants of yeah, the Blakes, right? Yeah, so um, basically been told that they've put a claim onto the painting and I've got three options really. Either withdraw it from sale and Sotheby's keep ownership of it till I get a lawyer and prove that it's mine. Sell the painting and give them a percentage which they've come back with they want 75% of the sale price. Right. Or sell, sell the painting and the money stays ownership of Sotheby's in their bank until ownership of the painting it's been proven again so so I've have got... you have you considered those three options i have considered them but you know it's like out here i've got <laughs> we're like in the afternoon here england's all shut up like you know it's late now i've got no legal advice nothing so i really don't know what what to do what to do for the best it's come as a mass mass blow this has this was not what I expected. No, I, I, I feel for you and I can understand how that must put you in, 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 a, in a real quandary at this late date, this late time of day. Now, um, whatever I have to say um, m must be predicated with the fact that this is your decision and I can't influence it at all. But what would concern me, and I'm now just speaking purely from a professional point of view, what would concern me is a picture that uh, people are, are, are razzed up to consider and, and, and possibly commit funds to which is then with, withdrawn, uh, can sometimes damage the picture's commercial prospects in the short term. Um, it might be rather difficult to represent it with the same energy in a sale in four or five months' time. I can't believe this, I really can't believe it. Dad's going to be wondering what the hell is that? It turns out that Sotheby's legal checks had already established a link with the Blake family. Back home, their European general counsel, Tom Christofferson, explains. So who did you talk to? Uh, we spoke to Iona Murray, who lives at Myrtle Grove, which is the Blake house. Um, and she is the granddaughter of Lady Blake. And what did she tell you? I uh, explained to her that we received a very valuable Homer, uh, which had been found 20 years ago on a disused tip nearby. So we wanted to know whether she had any 
records or recollection of this painting or having owned it, or whether in fact she'd had any burglaries as well that could explain its, its appearance. Um, she called us back a few weeks later to confirm that she'd discussed this with members of the family and that they had no record of owning the painting or, and hadn't registered any burglaries at Myrtle Grove with the police. When you were doing your due diligence, did you show a photo of the painting to the Blake family? Uh, no, we didn't. When we went to see them at the beginning, we described that we'd found a valuable painting by Homer. In fact, I had quite a long conversation about Homer and uh, um, Iona Murray told us about a family story that they thought Homer had once painted with Lady Blake, so she knew exactly who he was. Why didn't you show them a photo? Um, I'm Would not have been sure easily we, done. I'm not sure we had one at that point. We did show her one later. Um, but we didn't at that point. We just described the painting and asked her to go away and see if they owned any. Bit of a mistake in hindsight, do you think? I don't think so. I mean, if they'd asked for it, we'd have sent it. And we sent, we sent them a sale catalogue several weeks before the sale, and it was in there. And, and did they respond to that? No. Well, what this whole episode has shown me is that no matter how much due diligence you do, at the last minute, someone, somewhere, can come out of nowhere and say, this painting is mine, and there's nothing you can do to prevent that happening. Late night in New York, and the Blake descendants contesting ownership have told Sotheby's they think the picture should be sold and have suggested that Selina should be entitled to a quarter share of the proceeds. We've now heard she's rejected the offer and is asking for them to provide proof of ownership. Both parties have, however, agreed to let the sale go ahead and sort out the proceeds later. Selina wants to see the picture one last time. There it is. I just cannot believe that it's the same one. Oh, God. I don't think I want to get rid of it now. It looks really nice. God, you score some... You have. <laughs> God, that is absolutely wonderful. Even though I've moaned about it, to be honest, if I would be honest, I won't let Daddy and me say this though, but I am actually honoured to have had, for the nine years that I've um, had it, to be actually to say I've had a piece of art by him. Tony and Selina have decided to join me in the auction room to watch the painting being sold. I have $120,000, bidding here now $120,000. I have $130,000, $140,000, $150,000, $160,000. $160,000, still on my left now, $160,000. The room is filling up with eager art buyers. Our picture is lot 16, so we won't have long to wait. 15's against you. Seeing if Philip's bidding on anything. Again in the center now, ladies bid. At $115,000 and in the center for you at $115,000. Then, in a dramatic development, 10 minutes before the painting is due to sell, Selina is summoned by Sotheby's staff. I've just been called into a side room and basically be informed that I either take 25% of the sale price or the, the opposition, wherever you want to call them, are stopping me selling the painting. And I have asked, being so the painting is in my name, it's legally mine to sell, as far as I was concerned, and they've said it's not. They've took legal advice and can stop the sale. We must try and find the legal department and find out what's going on, yeah. I think, because um, yeah. you're, you're not being given enough information on this. No. I mean, if there is an injunction uh, or a legal process has taken place, I, I think I think you at least need to know about it, do you yeah. not? Let's go and find somebody, shall we? Come on then, let's go. I don't know where the hell anybody is. 
We'd much prefer to be able to do this privately, um, given that these are negotiations and this is very tense, and I recognise that you've got a culmination of a... Of a but it seems that this is not a negotiation at this point. Uh, this is an ultimatum. Um, this is a negotiation at this point, and we would prefer to just provide this to you privately. We've got so little... Why are they doing this now? <coughs> How have they got the right, the legal rights, to do this to me now? What have they got? Did you not know any of this yesterday? That this could have no, this all been three hours. I mean, that they've got the legal right to stop the auction. Well, I think you you know that when a claim has been made, um, we then have to make a very yeah. I thought the three options I was given yesterday were my options. I didn't know that they they changed their position. <laughs> and do they have any any legal basis for that? I mean, is there an injunction? Or they do, not have a, they do not have an injunction. So why are you when, responding when, as you are? When, 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 when someone comes forward and makes a claim of ownership without an agreement of the parties, it's, we, we can't go forward because we're, we have an obligation to pass good title to the purchaser. And right now, we, we're not in a position to determine, given the potential complications, we don't, we, there are new facts coming there are new facts coming to light. The law in this area is very complicated. And we're not in a position now to, as Sotheby's, to determine who, has, who actually has ownership. Even That's though it could damage the commercial prospects for the picture by withdrawing it at this stage? Correct. Right. They made a counter offer of 70%, 70 to them. No. No. Did, okay. did, did, did you have any further counter offer you want to make to them? Withdraw it. No. Where? Withdraw it then. Okay. That's it. So, what um, other option have we really? Um, the decision I, is yours. No. The decision no. Is no. Okay. 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 We will let the, um, the claimants know. Yeah, just let them know that they've damaged the painting. Yep, we've, 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 we've raised that with them already. But I think um, Selena's message is yeah. clear. Selena's message is clear. Yeah. And um, uh, this is uh, yeah. obviously not the resolution that any of us would have wanted. And uh, we'll come back to you as soon as possible to let you know if there are whatever further developments there might be. Okay, okay thank you. I understand this, your and, position. Um, thank you. We'll be back to you. Right. We'll just mingle around. Selena must now break the news to Tony. You're right, Dad. Yeah. Right. <laughs> did you hear? Huh? Did you hear? Did you did you hear? Lots sixteen and something else has been withdrawn. No. Lot sixteen. That one. Been withdrawn. Has it been withdrawn? Yeah. Why? Because the others. I've stopped it without any legal documents. Stop the sale. They wanted to give me 25% of the sale, and they have 75, and I weren't willing to do it. There's a gun, but now he's gone then. That's it. It's real meltdown. I mean, I've known some dramatic moments at auction, but not quite like this. Bring the back of your catalogue and particular attention to Article 1, which states... Now, can you believe it? I just got a tap on the shoulder. It's from the descendant of the Blakes. He's over here in America, and he wants to claim his picture. He also wants to talk to me. Simon Murray is the brother of Iona Murray, who was Sotheby's original contact at Myrtle Grove in Ireland. He's agreed to speak to us on camera. Am I right in thinking that you are a descendant of the Blakes and you are the other party in all of this? Uh, that's correct, yeah. Um, uh, Sir Henry Blake is my great-great-grandfather. And how did you get to hear about the picture coming up at auction? Really, w w we were on holiday in New York and um, my mother rang up in a bit of a state on Tuesday morning and said, um, uh, I see in the Daily Telegraph today, I, and I only bought it because I wanted to get the, thing, the news about the Chelsea Flower Show, I see that they're, they're selling um, the, the picture in, um, in Sotheby's New York. And she asked me to, to see what I could do. But am I right in thinking, though, that uh, Sotheby's uh, contacted uh, your mother uh, and asked her whether there'd been any thefts? Um, no, not directly. Um, what happened was um, the Irish contact for Sotheby's uh, made contact with uh, my mother's house, Myrtle Grove, uh, and uh, left some telephone numbers asking them to communicate. Uh, and um, uh, unfortunately, there was something wrong with the numbers. They, they didn't work. And um, my mother was, in fact, out of Ireland at the time. So uh, for one reason and another, uh, those calls were 
never chased up by Sotheby's. They, they never sent her a photograph of the painting. But didn't she have the catalogue, though? No, they never sent the catalogue. Well, was not a catalogue then in the, in the receipt of no, some part of the family? No, no she's not had the catalogue. Uh, she wasn't told that it was in, today's sa in the sale, and the first thing she knew about it was when it appeared in the Telegraph. Are you confident, looking back on this, that the enough due diligence was done? I'm certainly confident about the due diligence. Um, that was done here, and we established a link at the beginning, or a potential link, and we followed the link up. We checked with the local police, the local press, we checked with the art loss register, and then we checked with the family. Because you've got Simon Murray, who is claiming that if he'd known about it, or that if his, his mother had known about it, they would never have let the sale go ahead, and the first they knew about it was they saw an article in a newspaper. I'm quite surprised about that. Well, that's what he's claiming. I'm still surprised. <laughs> we spoke to his sister, who confirmed she'd spoken to his mother. I'm mindful of the fact that you have also, in order to allow the sale to proceed, uh, offered the family a, a proportion of the proceeds. Why have you done that, uh, if, if it's your property? Well, um, I view it r really as... Uh, I mean, Miss Rendell must have had an emotional roller coaster. I can see that, and I sympathise with her greatly. I mean, it must have been horrifying for her, and um, I, I wanted to avoid years of, of litigation, mm. um, and also, um, it was, just, if you like, a kind of finder's fee. What is it that you do for a living as a bit of interest? Uh, I'm, um, I'm a... <laughs> I, I was formerly a, a, a criminal a barrister, um, and now I do um, uh, civil, um, civil law. So you're a lawyer, so you're pretty well equipped to handle this yourself, then? I really hope it doesn't get down to that. Um, as I say, I empathise sincerely with um, uh, Ms. Randall's position. It must be horrible. She thought she'd won, she'd won the jackpot, mm. um, and you know, they picked up some rubbish off a tip. Uh, they discovered it was worth £100,000, and she's probably already in her mind spending it on... Mm. Um, swimming pools and um, cars and so forth, but um, the reality is this is a family picture. If this is a family portrait, why don't you want the portrait? You know, why don't you want the the memory of the of the three ancestors rather than the money? Myrtle Grove, like all these old houses, needs a lot of money to maintain it, um, and uh, unfortunately, it seems that this is a valuable picture. We haven't got any other valuable pictures. We've got a lo lot of pictures of members of the family, but none of this quality. Um, and so it seems, unfortunately, that the, the best way to raise funds to repair the house would be to sell it. This is our painting. It was stolen from us. Um, well, you don't know that for sure, though, do you? I well, mean, uh, there's, there's... The circumstantial evidence, Philip, is overwhelming. Um, I mean, it really is. Uh, I mean, couldn't I, it have been given away? It seems it, it, that is... Uh, uh, very highly unlikely. How customary is it that something like this can happen at the last minute like this? It's the first time I've seen it in nearly 15 years. Really? In the business. This last minute? Yes. Yes. It's rare. Three weeks later and the painting is locked in the vaults of Sotheby's New York. I decided to see how Selina was doing back home. At the moment, we're just waiting for him to come forward with some evidence. What evidence that, that they had the painting? That the, the paint painting was in the possession of the Blake family. Yeah, or in that home, because they're saying it was stolen 20 years ago. But they never knew they had it. But they never reported a break in and stuff. I just, as so I'm saying, I can't get my head around it. I really can't. I just don't know how somebody can say that's ours, although we never knew we had it. Gosh, what did you say to the kids when you came home? I did think about that. Oh, actually, not a lot. The kids met me at the airport, which was lovely. Um, I was just really upset. All I wish is that they had to come forward when they were first contacted. It would have saved a lot of heartache, a lot of grief, an awful lot of money. You know, this painting has cost me so much money that I never, ever had in the first place. It's now two years since the painting was taken to the roadshow, and for the past 12 months it's been locked in a safe. Incredibly, there's still no resolution. Selina and the Murrays are at loggerheads, and lawyers are involved on both sides. Can 
you believe it is a year since that auction? And we're no further forward. I have to say, you know, for Selena, all the hopes she had for this picture have not materialised. The Murray family have been in touch with the Art Loss Register. Selena has had a visit from the police warning her she may have handled stolen goods. It's got really messy. I, I really feel for Selena. My, my heart bleeds for her. But we've got to try and see it from the other point of view. I mean, Simon Murray is claiming that this is their family portrait. I mean, we're in real stalemate. In the meantime, Simon Murray says he's found definitive evidence regarding the provenance of the painting and its connection with his family. Well, let's start off then. Who are these people? Well, in the middle, you've got uh, Olive. She's my great-grandmother. And her two little brothers, Arthur on the left and Morris on the right. Edith Blake, Olive's mother, was a very keen correspondent with her sister, writing long letters. And they were full of gossip and chat, and they're a wonderful record. Entertaining at Government House was clearly one of the key parts of colonial social life. She writes as follows. The children's fancy ball last night was such a pretty sight. If only you could have seen it. Our children looked very well. Olive, as Princess Perizard, wore a bodice and upper skirt of gold colour, with Nassau pearls and beads and fringed with sequins. It was the same dress that I had worn years ago. Of course, cut down to fit Olive. Oh, how, how wonderful. incredible is that? With gold stars and crescents, an underskirt of crimson with oriental embroidery. Here it is. There it is. On her head, she had a veil of crimson gauze. I hope to have a sketch of the three children in their fancy dresses done by Mr. Homer, an American artist who is spending the winter here. He lunched here one day and brought some of his very clever sketches for me to see. It was a great treat seeing anything in the shape of a drawing once more. And um, then on the 21st of January, she writes another letter to her sister. This morning, Mr. Homer finished his sketch of the three children in their fancy dresses. It is, I think, exceedingly clever. It is merely a sketch, not any attempt at finish, but the colour is very good. And it makes an interesting little souvenir of the ball. I mean, that, that is as good a documentation of a work of art's existence and happening than you can ever get. Uh, and um, she, she writes of the room in Government House where the ball was held, and she writes as follows. At one end of the room stood a huge earthenware jar that we picked up in the backyard of a cottage here. And um, that jar then appeared in the painting, and, um, and that jar is still in the possession of the family. So that's at Myrtle Grove? Yeah. Isn't that staggering? Wow. The more you know about something and its, and its history, and this is just absolutely bristling now with history, the more fascinating it becomes. I know that when you first found out about the picture, you were thinking that you would probably sell it. I mean, now that you've found out so much about it, do you still feel like that? No, well, as I say, I think we're, we're actually rather keep it, um, because it is such a special picture. And um, as my great-great-grandmother says, the colours are wonderful. Um, the composition is very, very pleasing. Um, and it's, um, it's a very significant part, I think, of, uh, of my family's history. Um, and we'd, we'd love to, we really, we really want it back. I like it. I actually enjoy looking at it. I learn to appreciate it, I suppose. It's a year since we last visited Selina, and with a copy of the painting on her wall at home, how does she feel now? Twelve months ago, you know, I would have willingly sat and sorted this out with him, but obviously I never had the opportunity to, because by the time I'd got home, he'd got other people involved. So if he was to contact me and ask to sort it out, I would just ask him to go through my lawyer at the moment. I just don't know how long this is going to go on. I'm just answering questions that they're throwing at us as honestly as we can with, with that's it. Um, I don't know whether they're intending on striking a deal. I have no idea. At the moment, it's just going round and round and round. This small painting has had a huge emotional impact and pulled everyone involved with it in different and unpredictable directions. It's really not that unusual for a painting, particularly an old painting like this, to get mired in this type of controversy. 
I mean, having met Simon Murray now, I have a much greater understanding of why this painting means so much to him, to his family. But one of the questions we set out to answer at the beginning was, how did that picture get to the dump? And we still don't know. And what about the value of the painting? I mean, how is that affected now? Well, ironically, the value's probably gone up because we now have provenance as to when it was painted, why it was painted, for whom, who it represents. I mean, provenance, a story like that, is so rare in our world. And also, just think, this started out life as a piece of paper found on a rubbish dump. We've managed to transform it into a massively documented and significant work of art. The money isn't the big issue here. It's the morals and the way we've been dealt with is, is the bit that I think upsets me more. If Dad and I hadn't picked it up, the painting would have been ruined. You know, and then that piece of history would have been lost. We can only be honest. Whether our honesty loses us the painting, so be it. I've had a great journey. It was never, ever intended, never expected. And it's been a really wonderful experience.